Hi, this is Professor Fernandez. In this video, we are going to talk about Module 2 in Lesson 13. So in the previous module, we talked about scalar line integrals over planar curves with respect to the arc length. In this video, we are going to generalize away from using the arc length and consider um, integration with respect to x or with respect to y or both. And I've defined here in this definition how that works. And it's effectively a copycat of the definition for the line integral with respect to arc length in the sense that if I just scroll up and remind you of how we had um, operationalized that definition over here, what we said was that if you wanted to calculate that integral, you parameterize the curve first in terms of x of t, y of t. Um, and then you certainly substitute x and y into your function. And then ds becomes this. So that was the equation that we derived. Um, so we can imagine now, what if uh, I want to integrate only with respect to x? In other words, uh, there's no variation in y, just variation in x. Well, then what would happen over here is that this dy dt would go away. Um, and this would be the square root of dx dt squared. So I would just get my uh, x prime of t. And then this dt um, would, uh, would stay uh, and go along for the ride. So if I scroll down and look at my new definition, that's exactly what's happening here in the first step. So if I'm going to integrate with respect to x, uh, do a line integral with respect to x over a curve c, then um, that big square root factor that is ds collapses into just x prime of t dt. You can see that the same thing will happen if I do it with respect to y. The big square root thing collapses to y prime. And then in the third one, we are defining what this new notation on the left-hand side means. This might be a little confusing at first. It'll take some time to get used to it. Because notice that you know this thing looks like a normal integral. But then this thing looks like it's missing an integral sign. Um, and that is a bit of laziness on the side of the mathematicians, so uh, I'm a little bit guilty of that. Um, that is the reason why this is here in the definition. So this part of the equation is being defined as um, this normal integral plus this other integral. So in other words, when you see a line integral which has something like this as the quote integrand, it really does mean that you're integrating twice. You're integrating um, f and you're integrating g over the same curve. With all that out of the way then, let's look at this example to see how this stuff all works. So suppose c1 is the arc of the parabola blah traced from minus 5 minus 3 to 0, 2. So let's draw this out. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 1, 2, 3. So this is minus 5 minus 3 and then 0 comma um, uh, 1, two. Okay. Um, so I'm going to trace out this parabola. And how far does it go in the, you know, notice that this is x equals 4y, 4 minus y squared. Um, and it starts here and it go, and it ends there. Um, a few more points to draw might be helpful. Notice that when x equals, uh, if I set x equals to uh, zero, I get 4 minus y squared which gives me y equals plus or minus 2. Um, so when y is uh, minus 2 over here, I'm crossing the x-axis. When y is plus 2 over here, I'm crossing the x, uh, I'm crossing the y-axis, x equals 0. So these are also points on my parabola. Um, I can also think about what if y is 0? Then I get x equals 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So now we can kind of see the parabola emerging. So it goes like that. And again, it's traced out in that direction. Um, how do I know that? Um, I'm given, I'm inferring that information by the fact that it says traced from two. So that's one way that you would know the direction. Okay, so now I, I've uh, drawn my curve and the next step is to parameterize it. Um, various ways to do this. Again, I'm gonna stick to using T. We don't have to, we could use some other parameter, or we could just use the natural parameter, if you will. X is written in terms of Y. We could use Y as a parameter, but I'm going to stick to T's. And how am I going to parametrize this? Well, so uh, taking the cue from the fact that, you know, one variable is already solved in terms of the other, I'm going to let X 
uh, I'm going to choose y to be t, and then x is going to be 4 minus t squared. And again, if I substitute that in there, I get x equals 4 minus y squared. Check, since that is the curve that I'm given. So I have my power penetration, and then we are going to need um, not the big square root thing that we were talking about in the previous lesson, dx dt squared plus dy dt squared, because we're not doing a uh, line integral with respect to arc length. We're doing a line integral with respect to dx first, and then with respect to dy. So I am going to need um, information about going back up here. Information in the first integral, I'm going to need x prime. In the second integral, I'm going to need y prime. So I'm going to calculate that here. So x prime of t is minus 2t. And then y prime of t is 1. So then I'm going to go here, and this is going to be the integral of y squared, which is t squared, times dx, um, which is what's being converted to x prime of t dt. So that's minus 2t dt. And then plus x, which is 4 minus t squared, times dy. dy is what's getting converted to y prime of t dt. Uh, y prime is 1, and then dt. And then i got to figure out what t ranges from. Okay, So t here is a equal to y. So if I look at my bounds for y, then I can figure out what my bounds for t are. They'll be the same. Notice that y starts over here at the point negative 5, negative 3. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that is the lowest bound for t. And then goes all the way up here to the point y equals, uh, to the location y equals 2. So that is my upper bound for t. So I'm integrating from minus 3 to 2. Those are my bounds for t. And then I'm just going to clean this up a little bit and then talk some more about line integral. So I get minus 2 t cubed dt. Um, plus 4 minus t squared dt. And at this point, we really do kind of combine them into the same um, integral, and we don't have these two rogue dt's floating around. So I get minus 2t cubed minus t squared plus 4 dt. Once again, we've arrived at a single variable integral. This one is just a polynomial integrand, so we can definitely integrate this um, using single variable calculus techniques. So I will let you fill in the details and verify that you end up with, um, in a mixed fraction form here, 40 and 5 6, or if we put it into the um, normal fraction, non mixed fraction, this is 245 over 6. Okay, so um, this is the meant to be an, a very quick example illustrating again uh, this definition whereby we can now integrate either with respect to x or with respect to y or we can do both at the same time uh, which we define by adding these integrals separately together so we've done that in this example okay so the next thing that I want to show you is not an example but really just a few comments um, in the first module in this lesson, if you go back to that video, we talked a little bit about the derivation of the line integral and how this magic square root um, term factor showed up. So I'm scrolling up here to remind you what that term was. Um, this thing. And you can see here, I, you know, led, this is all left over from the derivation that I, that I did in that video. Um, it showed up based on looking at an argument of how you look at small changes in the arc length. Um, but there is a very, very different way to have done all of this stuff. Um, and that's what I want to expose you now to. It is just an exposure at this moment. Um, more information about this alternate method will come in future lessons in this course when we start talking a bit more about vector analysis. But this is me planting the seed for all of that. So um, this is what I'm going to say down here. But before that, let me just make a quick comment that everything we have done in this lesson can be extended to the case when C is a space curve. In other words, a curve in three-dimensional space, right? I have been drawing, like I did in the previous example, you know, this parabola uh, in x, y. Um, in the module one video, um, we had a curve that looked like this. Um, and then in the first example, we had a circle. These were all plane curves. So we can extend everything we've been talking about with line integrals to space curves. So what if I wanted to find the line integral of a function, 
across this curve in space that goes from there to there. Um, I lose this nice interpretation of area of a curtain, you know, because now the function f of x, y, z, its graph, I need four dimensions to picture. So I, I, I can't really tell you much more about how to think about this line integral. However, as was the case with triple integrals, where we can't exactly always visualize what's going on, we can calculate them, and they are useful in various real-world contexts. How do we calculate them? We just extend what we just did. So I, I would parametrize the curve using x of t, y of t, z of t, um, and then you can show using very similar arguments to what we did in the module one video that the ds arc length parameter along this now space curve is the square root of what it was before except with this extra dz dt squared term. Um, so you'll explore some of this in the practice problems if you get a chance to do uh, work through some of those. Okay, so now back to what I had mentioned earlier about the alternate way to think about all this. Um, and the alternate way is using vector valued functions. And I noticed vector valued, so I should put a D there. So I'll make that correction after the video, vector valued functions. So recall from a long time ago in this course, lesson four, that we can view a space curve as the range of the vector valued function r of t equals x of t, y of t, z of t. Recall also that when we take the derivative of r of t, we're just differentiating component-wise. And if we were to take the norm of this, it'd be the square root of the sum of squares, right? So that's how we define taking the norm of a vector. Notice that what we've obtained is exactly this factor that I was talking about a minute ago. In other words, we can write the line integral of a function of three variables as normal, uh, what, we, what we did up here, right? And re-express that in this following form, where this, the square root piece, is the norm of the vector value function that contains, oops, up here, contains the parametrization. Effectively, the vector valued um, view of parametrizing the curve we have talked about back in lesson four. So this um, square root factor, which again came in module one's video from analyzing small little bits of the curve and, and doing a limit argument, can also be understood quite nicely as the norm of the r prime vector, which if you'll recall from um, earlier in the course is related to the tangent vector. So I'll draw things out for you in a bit, but last thing to mention is that this is also new notation when you see f of r of t, it might seem a little weird, how can you substitute a vector valued function into a function? Seems very strange. But this really just means, this is shorthand for f of x of t, y of t, and z of t, right? So, you know, we mathematicians just invent notation when it's convenient, and this is one such time. Why? Because r of t could be you know, for us, it's been a vector valued function with two components or three components. But in this notation, you can easily extend it to 37 components if you wanted to, right? So it makes it a nice notation in that sense. Okay, so long story short, by comparing this side and this side of the equation, we notice that ds is equal to norm of r prime of t dt. That's what I wrote down over here. So let me draw this out for you in 2D, even though I've just talked about everything in 3D because it's the same, just one dimension lower. So if I have a curve here, and I think of it now um, as being, I'm still thinking of it as being parametrized, but I'm not thinking of it as being swept out by some vector valued function r, as we were thinking at the very start of the course, r of t then. Um, if I go, for example, to this point on the curve, and I look at r prime of t, that is points in the direction of the tangent vector to the curve. So this is r prime of t. And then you can see that if I look at some small change in the arc length, I'm going to take this picture here and just expand it right here. Um, here is my, see if I can draw it more or less the same. Here's my curve, and there's my blue points, and there's my tangent vector, r prime of t. Um, the norm of my tangent vector would be literally this length. 
the norm of a vector is its length. So it's that length. Um, and it's that length multiplied by dt that is approximately ds. Okay. So uh, we could do the exact same triangle thing here. So this r prime of t has a certain component, x prime of t has a certain component here, y prime of t. And the uh, norm here is the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared. And then we do the same um, notion, uh, sort of manipulation in reverse that we did earlier. This is dx dt squared, dy dt squared. If I look at this now in a finite change context, delta x delta t squared plus delta y delta t squared. I can factor out 1 over the square root of t squared, and then I take the square root, I get 1 over the square root of t, and then square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared, oops, delta y squared, okay? So other word, in other words, the norm of r prime of t, which is this, is approximately 1 over square root of t times this. If I multiply by square root of t on both sides, I get norm of r prime of t times delta t is approximately this, which you'll re recall from the module 1, <coughs> excuse me, video, is delta s the change in this small arc length over here. So as delta t goes to zero, we get the infinitesimal version, which then gives us ds is norm of r prime of t times dt. And that gets us back over here. So to recap, there is a very nice way to think about what we're doing if you start off not by parametrizing the curve c in terms of parametric equations, x of t, y of t, but if you look at it instead as a vector-valued function. So, you know, the two are very intimately related. Certainly a vector-valued function, its components, the way that we've studied them, are the parametric equations of x and y and z, which are points on the curve. Um, the benefit is that when you do that, if you look at r prime and you take its norm, that is this factor that serves as the conversion from ds to dt. So it's, uh, you know, in many ways, a nice way to remember this factor in case you forget it. Um, and then it also tells us some, something nice about the geometry that, again, at each point uh, on the curve, you look at the tangent vector, and its norm is literally the factor by which dt gets multiplied to tell you how far along the curve you've gone. Right, how much arc length has changed by, uh, infinitesimally speaking. Okay, the last thing that I want to mention here, again, just for exposure's sake, later on in this uh, unit, this is the vector calculus unit, we will run into this notation. So some of the curves, um, let me think back, actually none of the curves that we did in this lesson have been closed curves, but if we had calculated um, a line integral over, let's say, like the entire circle x squared plus y squared equals 1. Um, that is what we mean by a closed curve. So, you know, if you pick any point as its initial point and you go all the way around the curve, you end up back at the same point eventually. Um, so it's a closed curve. In that context, we have this special notation with this little circle for the line integral. So just that we indicate to whoever is interested in this quantity, and we will be very interested in this quantity in the next few lessons, that we're integrating a line, we're calculating a line integral over a closed curve. Great, so that's the last little bit of notation, um, and that's all that I wanted to mention for this portion, and I will see you in the next lesson.